Okay. So you see the shirt is to go with the uh, color of the slide. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have the honor, and it's an honor <laughs> to have the pleasure to uh, participate in the, this conference. Uh, it's great to see some older faces, and it's uh, really rewarding to see as well some fresh faces, uh, meaning hopefully that uh, not just life goes on, the subject <laughs> also goes on. <laughs> so what's this about? It's counting singularities in the sense that uh, we look at, uh, say, hypersurfaces uh, and impose conditions on the coefficients so as to ensure the existence of points which kill both f and the gradient of f. That's what a singularity of a hypersurface is. <coughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So we are actually interested uh, more on the geometry of the space of the coefficients, in the sense of parameter spaces, than uh, precisely on the hypersurfaces with uh, the singularity we are, we are imposing on it, okay? So we want to know what's the dimension, what's the degree of the locus uh, corresponding to coefficients for which we get a singularity, and count, for instance, plane curves or hypersurfaces that display, well, that's a little, uh, optimistic, but we'd like to be able to count uh, hypersurfaces with a specified type of singularities. That's a little vague, and to remain vague until I'll show you the precise uh, <coughs> results and examples I'm interested on. In. Okay? So that's what count means. Uh, we impose a certain type of singularity on a hypersurface, and uh, that will give you a uh, subvariety of the parameter space of uh, hypersurfaces. And this counting means uh, finding the degree, which can geometrically be interpreted as uh, imposing the condition of passing through uh, the appropriate number of points. Each point you impose uh, is a hyperplane in the parameter space of the coefficients. Okay. So names, as in the Bible, right? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a subject with a very long history, and I, I won't even dare to start talking about history. But more or less, more recently, uh, the names of uh, Stephen Kleiman, Pine, Pandaripande, Goethe, Tseng, Shende, and I'm forgetting at least a dozen or twice or the two dozens of other uh, names. Uh, and the point is that they mostly work uh, on the question of the polynomial nature of the answers. I'll be a little more precise about that. Okay? And most of these works are about counting singular curves on surfaces curves moving appropriately in a family, and sometimes also the surface moving uh, appropriately. So uh, I wouldn't say that it's the fact that the field, so to speak, became crowded for me. I mean, uh, at some point, for most of uh, these people here, instead of just counting, uh, you want uh, structure 
of things like the generating series, if there is one, and so on. Uh, so uh, I've moved on to count higher dimensional hypersurfaces and uh, also non necessarily isolated singularities. Most of the motivation for the things I'll be talking about here uh, derive from three uh, books that I met. Okay? So there is Jessop's Quartic Surface with the Singular Points, which is about a century old. And where, at the very beginning, he says that, well, I'm going to talk about uh, singular quartic surfaces, but I won't say a word about the most famous ones, which are the Coomer surfaces. Because for Coomer surfaces alone, there is this beautiful monography, which was reprinted a while ago with uh, a foreword by Barth, which is very illuminating. I mean, I, I recommend everyone to try and read uh, <coughs> at least the foreword. <coughs> okay. And then, to my surprise, I found out that Maria Gonzalez do Rego, uh, a PhD student of uh, 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 Hartshorns, uh, wrote a thesis uh, on Hudson's book. Okay, so let's take the statements in Hudson's book. Oops, it's gone. Okay, so that's what she does. She goes through Hudson's book and puts it in uh, modern language, so to speak. Uh, and that's uh, somewhat my pet project, as I'll tell you later on, which is far away, at least for the time being. So let's warm up on uh, singular surfaces. Uh, why not start with quadric uh, surface in tree space? Huh? So the question is, for which values of the 10 coefficients uh, the quadric surface acquires a, a singular point? And we all know from linear algebra that this is governed by the discriminant, which is the determinant of the quadric. So that's the typical situation. We have the space of the coefficients. And in that space of the coefficients, uh, there we have uh, a nice uh, hypersurface of degree 4 in this, in this case, okay, which, which controls uh, the fact that the, hyper, the, the quadric surface uh, has a singular point or not. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I changed there and forgot to change here. Okay, so this is a knot, et cetera. Choose, Alex, choose another. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So let's increase uh, the degree from quadric surfaces to uh, still a surface in tree space. We get uh, that much uh, coefficients, as we learned from uh, Eduardo's uh, talk this morning, right? So a point uh, in PN corresponds to a uh, hypersurface of that degree, as we know. And uh, <coughs> the analogous of that uh, determinant that I wrote uh, a while ago is a general discriminant hypersurface, okay? which is a function of the coefficients, and uh, which I can't uh, uh, write down. Uh, it's a huge polynomial in general. It has degree that much. So it's four for the case of uh, quadrics, but then it grows uh, very fast. And that's the answer to uh, an enumerative question. I mean, that degree is just the number of singular surfaces of degree d passing through n minus one points in general position. Huh? So here in PN, we have a hypersurface, and that degree solves this uh, enumerative question. And that's due to Cayley. I mean, it's uh, Cayley 
you, you could spend the rest of your life reading Cayley. <laughs> So my goal here is to go on studying the locus formed by surfaces with specified singularities, specified to be made a little more precise in a little while, and no longer necessarily isolated, OK? So for hypersurfaces with at, at, at most six singularities, there are formulas which uh, were found uh, uh, some almost a decade uh, ago, uh, and which appeared in the volume dedicated to Kleiman's 60, 60th anniversary. So, uh, for instance, the degree of the discriminant, uh, if you ask instead of just one singular point, two singular points, then that's the formula. Three singular points, that's the formula. And you see three here is twice the number of singular points. The degree here, uh, three plus two, five plus one, six is twice the number. So there is some structure on the answers here, okay? So the number of singular points, three here, is just uh, uh, responsible for the degree of the answer, which is eight plus one, nine in this case. And this goes on for the next few cases. We can uh, write formulas explicitly for, OK? Never mind. So 18 is thrice 6. Such is life. I have no idea how this goes on for seven or more singularities. <coughs> let alone if there is a generating series, as in the case of curves, OK? So that could, see, could be question number one. For people from up, up in the north, right, at least. Now, it's interesting also to uh, watch the behavior for low degree. So for quartic surfaces, well, quartic surfaces make up a P34, 34 coefficients. Now, at any rate, each singularity imposes uh, four conditions. You want the gradient to, to be zero at the point, so it's four equations. So since we have 34, we could think of, uh, expect uh, quartics up to eight arbitrary double points. Each point uh, impose four conditions. There's room for eight. Huh? But it turns out that, uh, and then I quote from Jessop, seven points may be taken arbitrarily as nodes. But if there is an eighth node, it must be either the eighth point of intersection of the quadrix through the seven points, so it's no new condition, okay? Or, in the case of the general surface, uh, there appears uh, an auxiliary surface that controls the singularity. So, the message is this, I mean, uh, once you, you start imposing singular points, you cannot go as far as you wish without introducing uh, uninvited singularities. <clears throat> that can be seen, of course, already for the case of uh, plane curves, okay? But the phenomenon here is, uh, is more interesting. Now, we know from the example of Coomer surfaces that we can actually go as high as 16, still keeping the condition that the surface will have just isolated singularities. But then the 16 points must be in a very special position 
so special that they form the orbit of uh, one of those famous groups. Okay, it's the, it's, there is a group of order 16 acting there. It's a Heisenberg group, which is it's very nice. So there's a lot of uh, hidden uh, symmetries in geometry. Back? Sorry. Could you speak? Uh, go back a few. Okay. So as, as I understood, it's Kelly Bacharach, right? So he's saying that uh, this is a Kelly Bacharach phenomenon. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I. But I mean, you have a general equation for a quartic, and we can, you have a computer, you can play the game of imposing eight general singular points. Okay, you can solve for it. Huh? But if you do it, the actual singular locus will consist of the intersection of the quadrics through the points. So if you want to impose eight general singular points on a quartic surface, OK, you'll get an answer. But you'll get an answer which now has a full elliptic quartic complete intersection of two quadrics defined by these uh, eight points. And then the points that you imposed, ah, I want only those. They, be, they, they appear as embedded points in the uh, ideal in the Jacobian ideal of the hypersurface. That's amusing. So my pet project, which I won't be talking here, I have nothing to say about this except to to show the picture. I mean, that's that's beautiful. I mean, that's uh, uh, that's a quartic, a quartic with sixteen nodes. Uh, my pet project would be to find a degree of uh, the family of Coomer surfaces. Maybe the next meeting. Who knows? Okay. So, what we'll actually do is to move on to uh, imposing non-isolated singularities. So, if you go through if you go through Jessop's uh, uh, monography, I mean, he talks about. Uh, classes of quartic surfaces, which has a uh, double line, two double lines, a double conic, uh, and so on. So for me, at least, it's natural to go on and try to compute the degree of these loci. Now, if you just impose one single line, you get a formula for the degree of the locus formed by surfaces of degree d singular along that imposed line, OK? If you specialize d to 2, believe me, you get 10. In the family of quadrics with uh, <coughs> a singular line, I mean, it's just a, a plain pair, right? So it's dimension 6. If you fix six general points, choose three of them, then you can count how many uh, quadrics of a single line you get. It's just a combinatorics, and it's this 10 appears as uh, 6, choose 3, divided by 2, of course, because the first three points could have become the last three points, right? And that's precisely what this g gives you for d equals 3, d equals 2. So for d equals 3, we get also something very pretty. I mean, it's, it's a witness umbrella surface. So you see the double line here. OK. So we get a family of degree 504. Dimension of the family is 13. That's uh, not hard to see. And the equation is basically something of that sort. OK. There's a nice paper of a Bianca. Uh, where he classifies the uh, 
cubics with a double line. Uh, it's nice. And you can count the dimension of the locks of the surfaces, just counting coefficients. Right? If you want this line to be the singular one, the equation has to have this form, and just count the number of coefficients you have for A, B, C, and D, and uh, there you get, you get this dimension, just by counting coefficients. Subtract one because it's up to uh, constant multiples. And you add four because you're moving the line, right? So that's dimension of the family. For g equals two, dimension is six, you can retrieve from here, and for three is 13, which is also a special case of this formula. Now let's impose a nodal conic. Move from a nodal line. Nodal in this context means uh, it's nodal for the surface. It's not that the conic is nodal. <laughs> That's the classical name, okay? So it's a surface which has a, a double, a self-intersection which is a, a conic, okay? That's the meaning of nodal conic. So you can also find uh, the degree of the locus of surface of degree D singular along a conic. And you get something that starts like that and then ends up like that. And just to call your attention, there is a D here, a D15 here. So it's a formula of degree 16. And 16 is twice the dimension of the space of conics, okay? Just as in the previous case, I'm sorry, uh, the formula is uh, of degree eight, which is twice the dimension of the family uh, of lines. Uh, I don't have a plausible reason for this. What I can assure you is that uh, the degree must be polynomial and uh, of degree at most three times the dimension of the family. It turns out to be twice. I don't know why. Okay? So that's what we get. So for d equal four, that's one of the cases studied by Jessup. A quartic uh, with a double conic varies in a family of dimensions such and such, uh, we'll see, and of degree that much, okay? Which turns out to be the value of a polynomial, which I'll show how to get. So what comes next is uh, what are the steps to finding formulas of that sort. So it's the how-to, how to get formulas of that sort, okay? Now, if a surface is singular along, a, say, a general conic, which has just this equation, right? You can check that it must belong to this ideal. So you square the plane, take the product of the plane. So actually, you take the idea of the conic and square it. That's what I'm doing here, okay? So we have a parameter space of dimension eight, so it's a P5 over a P3, right? It's the plane, which varies in dimension three, plus a conic in each plane, so it's dimension eight. This A it will be responsible for the degree 16 of the formula. God knows how, okay? And then the formula is gotten just by applying bot localization at the fixed points under the natural C star action that we get, right? So there are four fixed points on P3, which are given just by the coordinate planes. And then on each fiber, you get uh, 
P5, so with six uh, isolated uh, fixed points. So you get a total of 24 fixed points. So you have just to use bot localization formula at these points, and this is something outrageous, outrageously mechanical. And I'll show you what are the steps involved in the full computation. So <laughs> we have the parameter space x. Look at the trivial bundle of equations of degree d, right? And then we have the sub-bundle defined by the condition that the equation of degree d lies in the part of degree d of this ideal. That's the condition to be singular along the conic, OK? You can check that the dimensions don't jump. So it's a, it's a vector bundle of the expected dimension that we, we get here. And then this is just a quotient, OK? Now, uh, if you projectivize this vector bundle, you're looking at pairs consisting of a conic which is the co x coordinate, and the choice of a uh, hypersurface of degree d, a surface of degree d, in fact, okay, candidate to be singular uh, along the conic. So we have this, it's a projective bundle that we get over x, actually, and its image in the pn coordinate is just the locus we want to compute the degree. Now, if everything is nice as expected, in this case, it's not hard to check that everything is nice. Nice means the dimensions behave as, uh, as expected and so on, OK? Uh, the map from this projective bundle to its image sigma is generically injective. This can be checked, which means that if you impose to a surface uh, the burden to be singular along a conic, it won't be singular along another conic. That's what generically injective means here, and it can be checked. So with these caveats, you can see that the degree of the image is just the top segre class of this vector bundle. Top here means 8, which is a dimension of x. And since UD was the kernel of an exact sequence with a trivial bundle in the middle, its segre class is just the Chern class of the quotient. And for bots localization, you just have to be able to compute the fibers. And then it's mechanical. OK? So what is you do? Bots formula enable you to compute this Chern class, which was this segre class, as a sum of contributions coming from the fixed points, 24 fixed points, okay, which has to be computed explicitly. I'll explain you these symbols here. So that's the C star equivariant Chern class of this bundle. Likewise, here is a C star equivariant Chern class of the tangent bundle of X at the fixed point Fi. So it's a Contribution of uh, 24 fractions, OK? So let's fix, for instance, this uh, fixed point. <coughs> now, we know that the tangent bundle to x fits uh, into exact sequence with contributions from the base and contribution from the fiber, OK? We're looking at the fiber here, so you can check that it's just uh, given by that much which comes from P3 dual, and that's the contribution from the fiber. You see, what is written here is just all conics in the plane x naught excluded the one which was chosen here. And this home that I'm writing here from the viewpoint uh, regarded as a C star space, it's just that space tensor the dual of that one, and I'm sorry, there it goes, OK? So we have uh, 
to account for this eight-dimensional space and uh, the so-called equivariant Chern class at this fixed point is just the product of the weights of this summons here. So let me explain you what's the meaning of this x1 over x0. This represents a C star space of dimension 1, okay, with weight x1 minus x0, okay? Likewise for the other ones. And the torsion class is just the product of the weights. So it's x1 minus x0 times x2 minus x0, etc., times x2 plus x3 minus twice x1. Uh, and there is no factorial there. Okay, it's just to say that I continue to be amazed by uh, that kind of numerology. I mean, it's, uh, it's very powerful. Okay, so that's the denominator which enters in Bott's formula. And for the numerator, you do something similar. I mean, you have to compute the fiber of that quotient QD at each uh, fixed point and compute the weights of the decomposition. It, and it all comes out naturally. Okay, so let's denote by x to power k the ideal spin by the monomials of degree k, okay, <laughs> and then you form the homogeneous ideal spin by the square of the ideal of the conic, okay, which is this here, it's this square, this times that, this square, Okay, you adjust it oops, to the correct degree, multiplying by the complementary degree, x to the power d minus 4. And then if you recall the definition of QD, QD is what? It's all monomials, but in the kernel we had the monomials which correspond to the vanishing at that conic. So that's... Uh, the contribution that we get here. So it's very explicit. In this case, uh, you can even write it down explicitly. So it's a C star space of rank 25, and the weights are just uh, as written here. So this 3x1 plus x2, that's an index 2 that should be here, comes from the weight of this summoned here. It's 3x1 plus x2, and so on. The last one is 4 times x3. <coughs> so we have 25 numbers, and then you compute the top churn class, which means the symmetric function S sub 8 on these weights. So it's the symmetric function given by taking the products of eight uh, factors in all possible uh, manners for this list of 25, okay? Of course, you don't do this uh, by hand. I at least don't do this by hand. Actually, you choose numerical weights to make the computations uh, to run faster. You can do that, okay? Because the result is independent of the choice of weights. And then at this precise fixed point, we get contributions as obscene as that, okay? So we get 24 fractions and it adapts to an integer. So in that sense, it's a self-correcting uh, algorithm, right? If you did something stupid here, you didn't get an integer. That's a, that's a bet. So what is this number here? It's the degree of the space of quartix uh, singular along a varying conic. That's it. You can go on to impose singularity along a plane cubic, it's a little more of the same. But then, just to finish up, let me talk, you, uh, talk about uh, uh, another very beautiful, not as pretty as Coomer's, but at least this one we were able to handle, which is Steiner's Roman surface. 
It's beautiful. It's very symmetrical. And you see now in its intimacy what a quartic surface looks like, a Steiner quartic surface looks like. And that's the clue to producing a parameter space for Steiner surfaces. Okay? You see, you get as a singular locus uh, three concurrent lines. Okay? So for each well chosen three concurrent lines, there is a, a system of uh, quartics singular along there. You put all these in a family and compute its degree. Okay? That's the last thing I'm going to talk about. So what's the dimension of the family? You can see that uh, it is 15, written as 16 minus 1. 16 minus 1, that's just to tell you that uh, it's an orbit. OK? So if you. So what's a Steiner Roman surface? It's that picture I, I, I even gave an equation for you. It's a quartic which is singular along three concurrent lines. OK? And then I want to get a hold on the family, on the parameter space of these surfaces. And then the idea is just to fiber over its intimacies, so over its singular locus. OK? So <coughs> it's uh, 15 in two different ways. It's 16 minus 1 because it's an orbit. But it's also 9 plus 7 minus 1. 9, don't read my lips, uh, read my, my hands. If you count the number of parameters for such a configuration, you have 3 for the point, and then lines through a point, it's a P2. So it's uh, 6 plus 3, 9. And then, given, for instance, the three usual axes, if you impose it to be singular on a quartic surface, uh, you'll be left with seven coefficients. You projectivize, then you get uh, 15 as the dimension of the family. So that's a 15-dimensional family of quartics I would like to compute the degree of. It was hard. <laughs> <coughs> it's easy after it's done. From now on, details you ask uh, uh, Adriana. Okay. <laughs> Oops. So, so all these interrogation marks correspond to numbers? I'm sorry? All these interrogation marks correspond to numbers, to digits? In a, yeah, in a sense, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe the number of months uh, it, it took <laughs> to end up. So as I said, uh, the plan is to put the three concurrent lines uh, in a family. I mean, it's a, just a generate twisted cubic, OK? So there are several many ways you could think of uh, uh, devising a parameter space for three concurrent lines. So the way I'm going to talk about here now very roughly is this. I mean, uh, what you'll build is a P2 cross P2 cross P2 bundle over P3. Meaning, P3, you fix the point of uh, uh, the meeting point of the lines. And then each line through a point is a P2. You're choosing three of them. OK? So 
And it will be a modification because I have to perform some blow ups to make uh, some things well defined. Oops. As a matter of fact, instead of looking at uh, the three lines, I'm going to look at the three, three planes that you can read from the same picture. And planes going through a point, that makes up a P2 as well. OK? So P2 now stands for the set of planes through a point in P3. Now, for, let's say, the local verifications that I'm going to explain, we may as well fix one of the planes, say P1, through uh, the point O, which will be also in the two other planes. Okay. So we start fixing P1, say the horizontal plane there, and then we'll choose P2 and P3. If you do this generically, you get the three axes, three lines. So the first thing is to replace P2 just uh, by P2 cross P2 cross, right? I mean, you, so you are left with just four coordinates to play around, OK? And then, since I want this line and this line well defined, the first step is to blow up each P2 at the point corresponding to this fixed plane. Once you do this, the line is, uh, of intersection is well determined. Okay. Doesn't like me. Okay. So after we've blown up each P2 at uh, P1, you also blow up the diagonal of P2 tilde cross P2 tilde, so that this line L23 will also be well defined. Okay. So. What we get is a vibration over P3. So P3 stands for the O. And this X tilde has fiber over O, OK, of the sort I've just explained. So that's for P1, that's for P2, that's for P3. But then you blow up one diagonal. You then blow up the other diagonal. It's fibered here over the first projection, P1, and then you blow up this product. OK? It's easily written and said. So the lines are everywhere well defined. What it turns out is that the variety we built here which is very explicit. The action is well understood. We find 576 fixed points. OK. We find the contribution for Bot's formula at each of these points. And then what Adriana came up with was something of that sort. So this 18 here, again, is twice the dimension of the, of the family, right? Family is. Yeah. Well, what, what was the dimension of the family here, after all? <laughs> huh? 6 plus 3, 9, yeah. 
Oh, but there was a fiber, yeah, but there are there still a... Uh, uh, No, I mean, nine is the dimension of the singular curves you're imposing, uh, right? The, the dimension of the variety, the total space here is of dimension uh, 15, which is six plus nine, okay? There are more questions than answers, so it's a good time to to stop. Thank you.